Two in the morning. The name of my loved one is Betty Jean Attaway, and she was my mother. Tanisha Easter, I am her mother. Darren Brinkley, and he's my husband. Joseph Drew, Sr., I'm his wife. Family member, we call them. One of my good friends. Um, my dad was pretty active. He was 79, but uh, he was a uh, young 79, healthy. He loved listening to music and singing, even though he did not have a singing voice. <laughs> With my mother, we were her world. We did everything together. Like, we went to Orlando one year before, and that was funny because she thought Disney was a waste of money. <laughs> my wife was an avid crafter and loved to be able to do crafts. I called her Dodge Grand Caravan, the craft mobile. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I think what made him happiest is coaching the kids. Well, Warren was a people person. That was one of the things that I insisted on when he was growing up, that he was not going to just stand around. One minute. He would say his rosary every single night, and he had a prayer list. It probably took longer to get through his intentions than it did to get through the rosary, and it's a long prayer. <laughs> She started the church in 1969, and it was 50 years of celebration. March 13th, it was her birthday. We had drinks, cake, ice cream, food. <laughs> we sat up and talked and danced all night and laughed. <sighs> March 18th was his 65th birthday. When I called him and I heard that cough and I said, hey, what was that? And he's like, it's just a tickle in my throat. In my mind, I was like, oh my gosh, I really hope it's not this. 30 seconds. And then three days later, received a call at six o'clock in the morning, just like it was four o'clock in the afternoon. Christina has COVID. The blood drained out of my head. Toilet paper, paper towels. We had food supplies. He was ready for it to come definitely not ready for it to already be here. My dad was the first documented person in Michigan to actually pass away from COVID-related complications. 15 seconds. She passed away on March 21st. Um, she was one of the early cases. Just in shock. Like, I cannot believe my mother just died in a pandemic. 10, 9, <clears throat> I still have to say it out loud because I still can't believe she has died in a pandemic. <sighs> Good morning. Today we have to have a very candid and open, important conversation with you. This virus is spreading exponentially. When a pandemic hits, you don't want to believe it's true. and. People thinking that this is like just made up virus. I mean, hell, I even thought that. I wish we would have been told in January how dangerous this was. Because my mother and all of us were following that advice. We were ill prepared for a virus of this nature to be here and it slammed us. They told us is because he had not traveled outside of the country, he did not qualify for testing. I guess it was like a criteria that you know you needed, and he didn't have enough of them in order for them to run the test. Whatever it was, they didn't give it to him. Diagnosed with pneumonia, and I couldn't understand why they were letting her go home at her age of 69. I think had they tested him, he should still be alive. A perfect storm. Before they ever said perfect storm, I said perfect storm. I think he contracted it at the hospital, me personally. He was like, I shouldn't have took this mask off. They told me I could take it off. And he said, my throat is starting to feel funny. I mean, everything 
was in a panic zone at the hospital. It was like a war zone in there. It looked like the world was ending or something. I'm not, I'm not giving up. I'm not, for sure not giving up. I'm too much of a fighter to give up. I'm not ever going to give up. The last conversation I had with my mom, uh, we stayed on the phone for about four hours <laughs> just talking. I appreciate all the prayers from everybody. Just keep my kids. That's all I want. It's for my kids to be okay. I was so grateful to have her on the phone for that long. I just want them to be happy. They stuck me into the emergency room and let me sit all roped up and gloved up and masked up so that I could just sit and hold her hand and talk to her. And I didn't know if I was supposed to tell her or not. But I told her that she was dying. Oh, the worst part is uh, not having anybody there to help you through it. It's always, what could you have done better? At some point, we knew that her heart was going to give out because he couldn't continue to beat that fast. And so the doctor gave me the choice. I was hoping that with me allowing her heart to continue to beat that there was still some chance that she would convert and I wanted to give her her last chance. From the time that I walked in there, they were basically like, my husband is not going to make it. And I said, well, if he knows that we're here, who's to say? Whenever I get down or feel like I can't make it, I always think about how strong she was, and that's kind of what keeps me going, because I think that was her greatest quality. So it's very hard to talk about him in the past tense, because he's still in my heart. It almost made me feel guilty that I was able to be with him, because it just... It's so hard, I can't imagine not being able to be there with the person you love. We wasn't allowed into his room, but um, <laughs> I was in the hallway and watched um, as he passed, so he wouldn't be alone. My dad was there when I was born into this world, so I didn't want him to leave this world by himself. He hinted that he was sick the last time we talked. He found him passed away on his bed. I didn't get my moment with her. I didn't get to say goodbye, a real true goodbye to her. That hurts. The nurse told me that she was going to stay with her throughout the night because she wouldn't want her mom to be alone. I had to think that we had to be very lonely for him. She was by herself, which is not how she lived her life. It's even difficult to discuss this now, but I feel as if I abandoned my wife because I couldn't see her, I couldn't be with her. We've been married 22 years, <laughs> so it's me and him. I know people say you'll recover, but I don't know. I don't think so. It doesn't feel like it. <laughs> Give me a minute. What's been the most difficult is um, I can't look to the right or to the left without seeing something that Warren bought me. And that's what I'm sitting in now, his car. And I treasure it because it reminds me of him. I talk to him, you know, mostly just saying that I miss him. <clears throat> Even that, I mean, maybe just tell him I love him and like thank him for being the dad that he was and just how he raised us. 
just hear what he had to say in like response to that. I know he loved me. I know that. Expressing that love was not his strong suit. You know, I take solace in the fact that that last conversation that we had, I said, Dad, I love you. Uh, and he said, I love you back. I love you guys. I know I don't say it. <laughs> I'm not the one to say I love you a lot. But <laughs> I love you guys. For me, my closure was being able to talk to her for as long as I did. Hey, I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. Even though I couldn't physically see her, me just hear her voice. I'm up here trying. No. I'm not going to tell you I'm not scared. I'm scared as hell. So, it's me saying I'm going to sign off now for a little while. It's, it's getting, okay. Okay, guys. Bye-bye. Do I feel like I've had closure? <sighs> yes and no. She's died. We've had a funeral. I haven't had closure because I didn't get to tell her I love you. One last time. I don't know if you could even really call it much of a funeral. Um, there was no actual service. There was no funeral procession. There was not really anything at the gravesite. We had to sit in our cars and watch as they lowered the casket in. Yes, my son has baseball and my daughter is dancing, but it's not the same as before. My son, not only was his dad his head coach, he would coach third base. So I think every once in a while, he'll be up to bat. He'll look down and it's not his dad standing there anymore. I know my father, he will always say, Candace, don't cry over stuff you can't control. You'll be okay. We live in the United States, and the United States protect their people. We don't have anything to worry about. And I feel like that same government that my dad had pride for failed him. Our national leaders basically, I feel like, gave us the big middle finger and said, if you die, you die. And I'm just angry. Um, I'm constantly all day long telling people, you know, they come in to talk and they pull down their mask and then I have a little talk with them and tell them that it's something to take serious because my mother passed away from it. That's hard. That's, you know, I think that's one thing I struggle with to this day. Like, this was canceled or this has changed or this isn't normal. I'm like, my, I, my dad is dead from this virus and he's not coming back. And a lot of those other things seem pretty trivial to me. There's no more, oh, it's my individual freedom. You don't have the individual freedom to threaten my life. No shoes, no shirt, no service, no mask, no service. I will be happy to compromise to be able to take care of my neighbors. We need to take care of one another. That's what I want everybody to know. Because if we never needed each other before, we sure need each other now.